welcome to Westside Community Church. This is a message by Pastor John Clark titled, It's Time to Get Moving. Let's join him now as he begins. I just want to say to you that you are the faithful. Uh, I love always the holiday weekends when it comes to church. So this is what you want to do. If you look around and your neighbor or your friend is not here, because usually at West Side there's about 2,000 people every weekend here. Uh, we clearly don't have that today. We have empty seats. If you've ever been to West Side, there's never em empty seats. We have chairs along the wall. So we know people are missing. You remind them that it was the greatest service you've ever been to in your entire life when you see them t uh, on Tuesday at work or you see them in their yard today. Uh, and if you, if you hear from them that they say their boat broke down, uh, well, you know, you'd be like, praise Jesus, you should have been in church. And so um, just remind them. But you are the faithful people to follow what God has. So Genesis chapter 11, verses 31 and 32. And I, and I want to talk today about uh, um, it's time to get moving. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where, where you know that you want to stay on track. You want to get moving towards where God is sending you. And, and, and there is within us uh, this ability to just uh, stay focused. But don't you notice there's people in our life who want to take us off track? Do you ever notice where there's people in our life who, who, want to, who want to derail us, detour us? Can I say to you who are married, women, listen to me, ladies, wives, listen very If you're dating, this might be something you want to take note. Singles, pull out pens and paper. You'll want to get this down quickly. I'm going to give you some advice here today. There is something about a man once he is behind the wheel of a vehicle and he is going somewhere that that in itself becomes a mission. All right? Do you understand? I mean, we are on a mission. I don't care if it's to Lowe's to get another roller. It's a mission. And what we don't like is when you ladies call us and ask us where we are at. And once we give you the location, you determine from that location where we need to stop for you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Exactly. Thank you, Don. You're one of the, my believers. Okay. Here's it. And you know it to be true. And what I don't like is the fact I've not, I've not been able to crack the secret society of this female culture, but you guys are working covertly against us as men, and we know it, okay? We just don't know how. Let me explain to you. Let me explain to you. A few weeks ago, I am going into town. I'm on M72 West. I'm coming down to 22 and Grandview Parkway, right? I'm in my vehicle. I am on my way to Lowe's to buy this roller and some paint. And my phone rings, and as the phone rings, I'm about eight cars back from the light, okay? It's turning yellow, so I answer my phone. I, I, I push the button. It's my wife calling. I said, hey, babe, what's up? And she said, hey, where are you at? And I said, I'm in town, because I was near town, right? I'm in town. And she says to me, are you anywhere near Tom's West Bay Shopping Center? <laughs> For those of you who don't have a map, at the corner of M22, Grandview Parkway, and 72, is Tom's West Bay Shopping Center. I thought, how in the world? Did, did one of you women drive by, see me, you call ahead to Michelle? Yes, he's nearing the zone now. <laughs> what is my code name? Am I, am I Red Leader? Am I Red Leader? Am I Blue Falcon? What, what, what is my, what do you call in on me, right? And I thought to myself, you are kidding me. I am not only near Tom's, if I turn left, I'm within 100 feet. And so I did what I should do. I, I said, no, I am nowhere. <laughs> I am nowhere near Tom's. Why? And she said, oh, I wish you could just pick up some things for me. And then she runs down the list of things, two of which include pleasures of mine, right? Chocolate and, and ice cream. And so I'm like, uh, and I pull into there. Can I say to you, you get us off track. You detour us away from what God had for us. I'm here to tell you today, yes, praise Jesus, one man. You've not been married long enough. You don't know better, but one man is with me now. Uh, the reality, ladies, here's the deal. We got, we're on a mission. We want to go where, where, where we're supposed to be going. The, today's message about it's time to get moving is about a, about a father and his son and his grandson who felt that they were supposed to go to a place and, and, and in their obedience to do it, they wanted to get there. They didn't want to get detoured. But we're going to watch what happens when your life gets detoured. Take your Bibles, Genesis chapter 11, verses 31 through 32. I got about 25 minutes to get this in and get on with it. So here it is. Verse 31 says this. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, uh, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, the wife of Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. May we not die before we get to where God is sending us. Let's pray. 
Father, this is yours. I thank you for your word. God, move us today. Don't let us be just uh, participators at a distance, God. Don't let us just be viewers. Don't let us just be on the sidelines. Engage us in this. Help us, captivate us, motivate us to the point where we feel like we're, we're feeling every moment of it. God, your word is for us today. There are people here who it is time to get moving. It is time to rise up from where we've settled down and get back on track, God. Keep us focused. Do not detour us. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. So verse 31, let me look at the second part of the verses. And together uh, they, uh, they left from, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. Now listen to me very carefully. A couple people in the first service didn't catch this. Some of you biblical scholars, those of you, you who know far more than me, listen to me very carefully. Canaan, we know, is the future promised land, okay? We know that's where the land is going to flow with milk and honey. Terah does not know Canaan is the promised land. Uh, Abraham, his son, has been called by God already to go to a land, and he will, he will be recalled again while he is in Haran, but, but he knows that God wants him to do something special. Abraham will become the father of many nations when he gets to Canaan. It does not say in this scripture, now listen carefully, it does not say that the Lord God came and said, Terah, take your family and go to Canaan. It does not say that. But I know it to be true that God will often move one so that he might get another into position. I know that God will at times take us and manipulate and move the situation around so that he can accomplish his purpose. If all it was was for Terah to leave Ur and get to Haran so Abraham, his son, could get to Canaan and be the father of many nations, so be it. But I'll tell you this right now. I know God leads us and God directs us whether or not we see it. And the reason why I say all that to you is I want to make sure we're on the same page. Because I believe at some level God was encouraging and leading Terah, the grandfather, the father of Abraham and the grandfather of Lot to pack up everything and head to Canaan, even though he didn't know at the time it was the promised land for the Hebrew children. So let's look at this. I, I, I have, have you ever taken a road trip? Anybody ever gone on a road trip? I mean, like a long distance. Anybody ever drive from Traverse City to Florida? Raise your hand if you've done that trip, right? A lot of us have done it, right? Do you remember those trips? Seriously, that's the trip where you got to go with three or four people. And the only way you make it in the vehicle is if you have a driver's license, right? you got to have drivers because from Traverse City to Daytona Beach is about 24 hours. And, and don't we all do it, right? You kind of get together. Hey, you know what? If we get tired, we just stop in Toledo. And if not in Toledo, on the other side of Lexington, we'll get over the river and we'll spend the night there. But you get in your vehicle, right? And it is foot to the floor and you're hauling to Daytona. You're going through Toledo and you're like, we're not stopping! You know, and, and, and then you choose, you make like a pack somewhere just south of Toledo. Somebody in the vehicle has to pee, and you make a pack that every bit goes into a bottle, right? Because we can't stop. We're not going to stop. We're going through. You get to Lexington, people are like, I'd like to go to sleep. You're like, I'm not even going to pull over. You drive. And then the driver just slides up over the back seat, right? You, no, nobody else has done that? That's why you don't go on 75. There's crazy people there, okay? And then the passenger slides in. It's kind of like volleyball. You know, one sets and then you move along. You do that thing when you drive. So you never done that before? Can you imagine Tara? He comes home and says, listen, listen, baby, we're going on a road trip. We're going to leave Ur of the Chaldeans and, and get Abraham and, and tell our grandson Lot. Three generations of people are going on a road trip. I don't know about you, but if invited to be a part of one of the generations to go on a road trip, I would. It's family, right? You don't want to travel with family. So they all load up their stuff. Can you imagine? They're, they're not only loading their families, but they're loading their possessions. They're loading their servants. They're loading their, their livestock. There's not two men in a truck. There's nobody here to help them get their stuff moved. And, and, and let me explain to you. They live in Ur of the Chaldeans. Ur of the Chaldeans is quite the place. It's a metropolis by standards in that day and age. It is located where the mouth of the, of the Tigris and Euphrates River come together. And there is Ur of the Chaldeans. It's a major trading post. Archaeologists found a university there, a museum, a library, a great commerce center, a huge village market, very industrious uh, uh, location. This is where they're leaving. They're leaving a pretty amazing place to go, I believe, where God wanted them to go, and that was to go to Canaan. And, and so they pack all their stuff up. I, I like the fact that the name of the place where they live is Ur. 
Ur of the Chaldeans. You can tell what kind of people live in Ur of the Chaldeans. It's, it's an advanced society, but it's Ur. Like Cedar. It's the same thing. There is, but it's a much more, I know, I know. I see, it's Memorial Day. You knew I, it's been since Christmas since I picked on you, right? I confess my sins January 1, but it's over now. We're near summer. Ur of the, I just want to make sure you're with me because we've got to turn the corner here pretty fast. So Ur of the Chaldeans, and so they're living, in, they're living in an amazing place. And they will travel now, stay with me, stay with me map-wise because I want you to get this. You'll have to have this when we close in a minute. They are heading northwest along the Euphrates River. And, 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 and just a mile uh, west of the Euphrates River is the Great Desert. And there is a mile strip of this fertile land that follows the Euphrates River. And they call it the Middle Ground. It is, it is partway between the river where it's lush and, and, and green meadows will feed the animals, where they'll draw water. But if you go too far west, you'll go through a desert. What's interesting is if you left Ur of the Chaldeans, which is here, and you went directly over to Canaan, it'd be only 150 miles. But you'd have to pass through the great desert. I wonder how many of us have ever tried to get to where we believe God wants us to go and to get there we have to go through a great desert. Terah is not doing that. He's going to head north. And, and what he's going to do is he's going to go through this middle ground and follow the Euphrates River between the water and between the great desert. And he's going to go some 600 miles. And when he gets to the top of the great desert, he's going to hook a left and he's going to head southwest just about 70 miles. And he'll be to Canaan, 150 miles versus 700 miles. But He's following God. They pack everything up and, and they head on out. You know, when you're on the right track, it feels really good, right? Are you on the right track today? Are you doing things right? Are you, are you in step with God? Are you following what he's doing? You're making your way? Nothing's more amazing than that. They set out. You know, I, I, I can imagine the, the first night, the road trip, right? I mean, everybody's moving and, 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 and Tara's encouraging Abraham and Lot and they're talking about, man, it's going to be great when we get to Canaan. It ain't nothing like Ur. We're going to have a great time there. First night, I bet you they don't stop to camp. The first night, it's like, just keep moving. No, Tara, we don't want to stop. Let's keep moving. And second night, everybody's like, you know what? We're not even going to set up tents, okay? We're just going to lay on the ground and stare up at the stars and talk about how great it is to, to get to where God wants us to be. Two weeks go by, everybody's still high-fiving. I mean, maximum capacity of energy level. But a month goes by, and they're still not to Canaan. Two months go by, and they're still not to Canaan. Three months go by, and they've not made it to Canaan yet. They've gone 600 miles. They've gone 600 miles. And they still haven't got there. Nobody's high-fiving anymore. Nobody wants to hear Tara talk about how great it'll be when we get to Canaan. Everybody is struggling with the fact that we haven't got there yet. I wonder how many of us have been following God or you have followed him and you have not gotten to where you wanted to be. It happens to be the next part these next nine words of interest to me, it says, but when they came to Haran, they settled there. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. It's the word settled that bothers me. It's the fact that, that Haran is not Canaan. Let me say that again. Haran is not Canaan. God did not call them to leave the Ur of the Chaldeans and go to Haran, did he? No, he said leave the Ur of the Chaldeans and go to Canaan. But they get to Haran. Can I, can I ask you a question? What was it about Haran? Was, was Haran, did they have a new amusement park? I mean, was there a new mall opening up? Do you remember when we were younger, those of us who grew up here in northern Michigan, we didn't have a mall. We had a giant. That's all we had, okay? Not a real giant, but like a giant store, okay? Anyways, and, and you had to go uh, to Grand Rapids to the mall when the Woodland Mall opened. That was a big thing, and, and you'd head down there. Haran doesn't have a Woodland Mall. I did some research about Haran. What was it about Haran? You discover that from Ur of the Chaldeans to the village of Haran is 600 miles. Tara and his family have traveled 600 miles. The average individual in this culture traveling by himself can go 20 miles in a day. But traveling with three generations and servants and all the household possessions and thousands of livestock, 
They may be covering five to six miles a day. They've gone 600 miles, easily three and a half, if not four months they've traveled. They've come a long ways. And it's interesting that Haran, by the way, those of you who are mapologists, I'll give you a little detail, that the Euphrates River snakes on up 600 miles out of Ur, and it turns directly to the north. Haran happens to be right on that bend where the Euphrates River turns directly north. It happens to also be here in Haran where they settled that the great desert just ends. Thank you, Jesus. That's my applause. I appreciate that for the map thing. Okay. Any thunder I'm going to take as an amen from God, okay? You all right? And any, any rain we hear reminds us that those sorry neighbors of ours, of ours are staying at home and they're not out on the boat yet, are they? That'll teach you. Okay. That's for the online guest. All right. I want you to see this. I'm not going nuts here just because I want to be nuts. I want to get, I'll make sure you get this. It is on the bend of the river where the river slows, and it is also where the great desert ends. That's where the village of Haran is at. Did you remember what I told you earlier on when I gave you a little map? It is 77 miles from Haran southwest to Canaan. They have come 600 miles. They have traveled for months only to get to this location, 77 miles from where they need to be. And the Bible says they settled there. And when I read that, it breaks my heart because I think about you and I. I wonder how many of us have traveled an awful long ways in, in obedience to God, trying to get to where God wants us to go, laboriously moving along the process. And somewhere along the way, we come to our Haran, and we settle there. I wonder where you've settled today. I wonder where you stopped moving. It's, it's, a, it's of interest to me. I began to think through it. I thought, okay, okay maybe, maybe they settled there because of fatigue, right? I mean, sometimes you just get worn out. It's a, it's a long journey. It's a tough uphill battle. Maybe, maybe they were just fatigued and worn out. Maybe that's why they settled there. I wonder if you've gotten tired. And when you came to your Haran, you settled there because it was tired. I wonder if it's disillusionment. I wonder if, I wonder if the dreams that, that Tara spoke of and Abraham talked of drew plain after a while. No longer did we believe in the dream and they become disillusioned. I wonder if you've come to your Haran and you've settled there because you no longer believe in the dream. I wonder if they got comfortable. Remember, first week or two, you're not even setting up the tents because not a need, but three months in. Three months in, I got to imagine that when you arrived near the bend in the Euphrates River where it moves north, Mama sets up the tent reluctantly. Abraham takes the, the animals over to graze in the grass near the Euphrates. A lot goes down to draw water for the umpteenth millionth time. They bring it back. Tara has built a fire for dinner. Somebody has to go out and find some wild game. They do this process. Night falls and it's dark by the time they eat the next morning nobody rises early nobody's got the gumption to move on we're worn out doggone it all we crave the familiar we remember what it was like back in Ur of the Chaldeans why are we here who cares if we're just 77 miles from where we need to go and and they gather around and and instead of packing up their stuff and moving on everybody just settles in and one day turns into two, and two days turns into two weeks. And unknowingly, I believe they settled at Haran because what else were they to do? They were worn out. The word settled shows us the picture of a boiling pot of water that once it has come to a boil, the heat is turned off and the water is allowed to simmer. To, thank you, Jesus. Allowed to simmer. Yeah, he's, he knows I'm getting somewhere good here. Allowed to simmer. And until it cools down enough, until it cools down enough, it settles and it no longer moves. I wonder if somehow we have cooled enough to where we've settled down to where we no longer move. The word settled in the original Hebrew language actually means to die down. 
we say to our kids when they get unruly in the store, settle down now. I wonder if some things have died down in our lives. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. I've had the privilege over 23 years of being a pastor, of talking to thousands of people. I can't tell you the number of stories of individuals who, who have ran into, whether in the place of business or across a dinner table or in a meeting in my office where I've heard these stories. I'll give you just a couple and I'll move on. We'll be done. It's quarter two. We're closing strong. Talked to a lady at an open house just the other day, and I said to her, so the, the kids are all gone. This is your last one to leave the house. And she said, yes. I said, so what are you going to do now? And she said, you know, when I was in high school, I always wanted to be a nurse. I said, really? I always thought you stayed at home and took care of the kids. And she said, I did. I said, you never became a nurse? And she said, no. She said, actually, we got married right out of high school, and I got pregnant within a few months, and then a year and a half later, we had our second child, and then the third, who just graduated this weekend. And she said, now that they're moved on, she said, I might get around to getting back to getting my education. I said, how long ago was it that? She said, almost 22 years ago that I had that dream of becoming a nurse. I said, why didn't you ever do it? She said, I guess we just got too busy. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. It was the executive that I had lunch with a year ago who began to tell me about the success of the company that he was running. And I said, are you the owner of the company? He said, no. He said, to be honest, he said, about 30 years ago, I was going to my boss's office to give him my two weeks. I was going to start a company that would rival what this one does. He said, as I sat across the desk from my boss, and I explained to him that I was giving my two weeks and I was going to move on. My boss promoted me that day. He doubled my pay, gave me more vacation, cut my hours, and pleaded for me to stay. He said, that was 30-some years ago. And he said, I've been there ever since. I said, did you ever start that business? And he said, no. No, I never did. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. It was the gentleman who told me about when he was 16 years old that God called him clearly at a retreat to be a pastor. He rushed home to his mom and dad. They were in bed. He knocked on the door. His mom said, it's okay to come in. He walks in. And he said, mom and dad, I just got to tell you what, what Jesus did. He called me to be a pastor. I'm going to go off to Bible college and serve the Lord. His father, he tells the story, rises up out of bed and says, no, you won't. You'll take over the business the day I die. And father went back down into the bed. That was 47 years ago, and he never has gone to Bible college. He's never served a day as a pastor. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. It was the guy who told me about his heroin addiction and his alcohol that raged and cocaine that he tried and marijuana and pills and prescription items. And, and he told me with a smile on his face, he said, all I got to deal with now are these damn cigarettes. And I said, wow. I said, when will those ever go in the garbage? And he said, these, these I'm hanging on to. How is it that he kicks six other habits but this one addiction? But when they came to Haran, they settled there. It's the lady who I talked to while sitting on the porch of her house. And I said, when did you build this place? And she said, 18 years ago. She said, we actually own property over on a lake. And she said, we were going to build our dream house there. But my husband lost his job that fall and we never got around to it. I said, does your husband have a job now? And she said, oh, yeah, he got a better job than he had before. I said, did you ever start that house on the water? She said, no, we never did. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. It's interesting that Haran is on the bend of the Euphrates River right here, right near that southern tip of the Great Desert. But you know what's interesting about it? Haran means foothill. It means foothill. It means that if you, were to, if you were to go the 77 miles to Canaan, it is uphill from here. And so I wonder if that's Jesus. Tell him I'm almost done. It, it, I, how many phones are going off at once? That is amazing. It's amazing. It's alerts. People want to know, are you on the water? No, we're Christians. We're in church. Okay. I'm almost done. I got nine minutes. Stay with me, people. 
It's at the base of a foothills. I wonder if the reason why they settled in Haran was that the last part of the trip was uphill. Haran meaning foothills. But I guess I've told all of that to you today to, to close with this. And it's the last part of verse 32. It says, Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. And when I read that, it breaks my heart because he, he lived 205 years, but he died in Haran. I, I, wonder if, I wonder if he'd gone in the village market a year or so after they settled there in Haran. And, and there a man had come from Canaan and he began to tell stories about this land flowing with milk and honey. And Terah must have stared with dumbfounded look at this man like, You've been to Canaan. How far is it, my friend? And he said, it's but five days' journey. I wonder if Terah rushes home. I wonder if in his mind he says to himself, I wonder if I can convince my lady to pack it all up again and let's go. We're so close. It's where we were supposed to get to, to Canaan. But I wonder if when he arrived home, the smell of dinner sounded so good. Abraham spoke of how well the flock were doing. And, and, and Lot had begun a new garden area for new crops. And they just stayed settled there. I wonder if Tara ever woke up in the middle of the night from a dream that scared him nearly to death. Because he saw what God had prepared for him. And he was still in Haran. You see, Tara lived for 205 years, but he died short of what God had prepared for him. Did you hear me? Tara lived 205 years, but he, but he died short of what God had prepared for him. I, I know there are things where we have settled on. I mean, I know there are issues where, 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 where we, we, we decided that this is as far as I go. I, I, wonder if, I wonder if Tara somehow felt good about himself. I mean, he'd gone 600 miles. Come on, who else has done this? But, but he decides to settle, and, and the worst part about us settling Especially if we settle short of what God wants for us, we run the risk of dying there. See, it's that part about being prepared that I believe that Tara died short of what God had prepared for him. Now I got like five minutes left. I want to talk to you about the things that always surprise me in life. And then, Andy, I'll, I'll bring you guys up here in a minute. I, I, um, you ever remember elementary school, those of us who are old enough? And I don't even know if they still do it. I didn't check with John Michael. But do you remember all the things we would prepare for in elementary school? Do you remember? We'd have fire drills. Do you remember fire drills? Praise Jesus for that. I mean, it got us out of school. Once a month, you'd practice a fire drill. Do you ever remember your school burning down? No, it's fireproof. I mean, you can't burn the thing. Down. Why are we doing a fire drill, right? But I remember fire drills. Uh, the alarm would go off and the teacher would ask us to stand. We would get in single file orderly while the building is gushing with flames. We'd walk to the, we'd walk to the hallway and we'd walk out and we'd stand by the flagpole and mess around and give each other, you know, those thingies. And so you'd hang out for a while. That was a fire drill. I remember we live here in northern Michigan. We ain't having a tornado since 1958. And we still have tornado drills. You remember that? The alarm would go off. We'd stand up. Did we ever do any school? Seriously. We'd stand up single file. We'd go out in the hallway and we'd kneel down beside the lockers and put our head between our knees, our hands over top of our head, and we'd sit there for three or four minutes. We always were preparing for things that never happened. Do you know how many Fridays just before a math test I prayed for God to rain down fire and tornadoes on that school? <laughs> never happened, did it? Did it ever happen to your school? I don't think it's the stuff that we've prepared for that's going to kill us. It's the stuff that we're not prepared for. As God is my witness, I will tell you about what happened Wednesday at my house. Something happened Wednesday at my house that I was not prepared for. I feel for Tara because in some ways he left Ur of the Chaldeans in faith to go to Canaan, but he was not prepared for what was going to happen next. I got, I got, I got, a, I got a sense of that. On Wednesday, I was mowing my lawn. I've become an old man, okay? I have a riding lawnmower now. My birthday was two weeks ago, and I had to buy myself the mower for my birthday. Did anybody hear that? 
I had to buy myself a mower for my birthday. But anyways, I got a riding lawnmower. And I was coming around on Wednesday afternoon around the back of the dog kennel going along the garage. And we have a mouse house that sits there. It's there. It's been put there by the pest control company. It's a six inch by six inch black box about three inches high. There's a hole that comes in one end and a hole that goes out the other. And in the middle is the treat for the mouse. Those of you who are animal lovers, I just want you to understand that I am eco-friendly. We have gone green with our mouse house. At least the color of the poison that the mice eat is green in color. But anyways, so what happens is a little mouse, that comes in this side, he eats some of the mouse poison, and he exits out to the outside. I don't know if there's mouse and ease on the inside. It explains to him exit and entrance, but that's the deal. I'm coming around the corner with my new riding lawnmower, and I see beside the garage the little mouse house. I don't want to spin it across the yard or suck it into the bagger, so I stop leaving the mower running, because I'm just going to jump off and grab the mouse house and set it up on the edge of the dog kennel fencing. Not a big deal. I've done this before, right? And so I jump off, casually relax. I've been, what? I am not prepared for what is about to happen. That's all I'm going to say to you. <laughs> now, I did not see Jesus, but his name came up. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Welcome to Westside. <laughs> I reach down casually as can be. And I grab the mouse house and I lift up. I don't look at it. I just lift up. And as I lift it up, I could feel the presence of something on the back of my hand. <laughs> oh, you have no idea what's coming to you. I look down and coming out of the one hole is a black snake with a yellow stripe. It has gone across my hand and gone under my wrist. And he is going for this right here, the juggler vein. <laughs> This is where he's heading. I know it. I've never seen this snake before. I did not see fangs, but I know he had them, right? You know he has them. And then when it happens, there is nothing that prepares you for this moment. I don't know if bodily fluids eject automatically. I'm not sure how that works, but it, it, it works. And anyways, so all I thought about was, get out of here. And then I screamed like a schoolgirl. It's really tough to do, but I was, man, I was pitching it right perfectly. And I did this whole like freak out moment, and I just tossed it over my shoulder. You remember the first time you threw a baseball or whatever? You just go, eh. okay, that's, that's what I did. I just tossed it over my shoulder, and I ran in this direction, and I was fast. I ran in this direction, but what, I, cannot, I, cannot, I could never do this again in my entire life. As I threw it, and I ran this way like a madman, that mouse house with the snake in it ricocheted off the side of the garage and came back and hit me in the back of the shoulder. And I could feel the snake against my neck. Remember this? The snake is now on my neck. And I go back to second grade. Stop, drop, and roll. Stop, drop, and roll. Stop, drop, and roll. So I fall to the ground. And I begin rolling across the grass as fast as I can. Now, I was at the back of my house when this began. I am now in the front yard. I'm rolling across the yard. And then I get the, <laughs> you ever get the, the heebie-jeebies? Like, oh, blah, 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 blah. Dirty, 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 dirty. So I pull off my t-shirt and I throw it away screaming and I run to my pole fence and I jump up on top of it, shirtless, covered in grass. And the mailman is parked in my driveway. He's got a box and I'm just standing there. I'm not attractive panting, okay? Half naked, just put the box down. I was not prepared <laughs> for the black snake from hell to come out and find me. You might as well come, Andy. We ruined this. <laughs> Can I say to you that we run the risk in our lives of getting to the place where of regret that we never quite got to where we needed to be. And if God has called you to be that nurse, then come on. You got 77 miles to go. It might be uphill, but, but God's got some things prepared for you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, I has not seen nor ear heard nor entered the heart of any man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Do you love him? Do you love him, right? Okay, then can I say to you, can I say to you then, if you love him, he's got some things prepared for you. Start that business. 
Come on, build the house. It's time to get moving. Take some night classes. Borrow the money. It's time to get moving. You're too close. Can you imagine? I has we've not seen what God's prepared for us. And you won't if you stay settled. You, you haven't even heard what God wants to do. And you won't if you stay settled. Your heart can't even imagine what God has prepared for you. And it won't if you stay settled. It is time, folks, that we rise and skip moving because God's got something more for us. Are you with me? Are you with me? So let me say this before you guys sing. Let me say this. It is Memorial Day. It is Memorial Day. It stands for those men and women who have fought for our freedom and died. May this Memorial Day mean a little more to you and I. May this Memorial Day be the day that we're willing to fight for the dream God gave us and get to where He wants us to be before we die. May it never be said over us that we died before we got there. I promise you, you'll get there. I promise you God's got some things prepared for you. But it's today that you get moving. Andy, help us. We're going to move on. Thank you for joining us at Westside Community Church. We hope to see you next week at our 9 or 11 a.m. service.